Whenever I look up US GAAP principles such as accruals and conservatism, I often find cold hard definitions that lack context. But how do these US GAAP principles relate to the accounts on the financial statements? For example, what does the principle of accrual mean for the balance of accounts receivable? And what does the principle of conservatism mean for the inventory accounts? Today I'm going to talk about US GAAP principles in a way that my college professor never taught me. So we'll talk about principles such as reliability, full disclosure, conservatism, historical costs, and the accrual principle. And so the reason why I say that my college professor never taught me this way is because, for example, one of the principles of reliability, the way that we learned in college is that the information on the financial statements needs to be reliable and verifiable, right? But what I'm going to do today is that I want to map into the actual financial statement. So I'm going to take reliability and map it into the balance sheet. So we'll drop it to my computer here and I'll show you, for example, line by line on the balance sheet, how does it tie into the gap principle that is most applicable. And so for reliability, uh, the way it applies to the cash balance is that the information presented on the cash balance needs to be verifiable via bank statement uh, through an independent confirmation. And so this is the kind of thing we're doing today. We're mapping and adding context to each of these US GAAP principles so that we understand it a little better. So that's the topic of this video today. Stick around. All right, so we're looking at the balance sheet for a company called Crab Cake Inc. And from the name of it, this is a company that makes uh, crab cakes or crabby cakes or whatever they make, it doesn't matter. What matters is that this is the ending balance as of December 2020 and that the balances are in millions. And so if we look down here at the current assets section and current assets obviously are assets that can be converted into cash within 12 months, right? That's why we call it current. And so for cash and cash equivalent, the ending balance is $19 million. And the way I want to show you this is that looking at each of these gap principles, and these are like some of the main gap principles, reliability of information, accrual, historical costs, uh, full disclosure and conservatism. And so for cash and cash equivalent, the most applicable ones are going to be reliability and full disclosure principle. So for the reliability, uh, the way that this relates to cash and cash equivalent is that the information must be verifiable uh, with bank statements via independent confirmation. And so the balances and this item here need to be uh, verifiable. So if I want to send out an independent confirmation to the bank and get a bank statement, I can tie back into this balance. And the same thing goes for short-term investments. So short-term investments are things like money market accounts, uh, certificate of deposits. Typically, these are the uh, short-term investment, meaning can be converted into cash within 12 months. And that's why we can include it here into current assets. And so for short-term investments, the same way for reliability, I need to be able to confirm this with a, independently with a bank. And so this is the reliability US GAAP principle. As far as the full disclosure principle, full disclosure principle means that you disclose material information to the investors that is relevant to them in the decision-making process. And so think of yourself as the investor in the company. What information would you like to know about the company's cash and cash equivalents, as well as short-term investments? And so basically, one of the things that we talk about here, one of the examples, is that you must disclose in your restricted cash. So restricted cash is the cash balance that sits on the balance sheet. You have right to it as a company, but it's restricted for a reason. It's tied up for a reason. And so one of the examples is that if you enter into a lease agreement, the landlord sometimes would require you to have a letter of credit for a certain cash amount that sits in the bank that is restricted in case you default on the payment, for example, right? So this amount sits in the bank, you have rights to it, it's yours, but you can't really access it and get the money out of the bank. And so restricted cash will be um, dis uh, disclosed here under the full disclosure principle. And by the way, any of the things that we talk about in this lecture can be asked of you in an accounting interview. And so if you have an accounting interview coming up, I highly recommend watching this video a couple of times and also look at my website for the night before the accounting interview PDF guide, which is really, really helpful. Okay. All right, the next item up on the current assets section here is accounts receivable. And as you can see, it's presented as net balance, right? So this is net of allowance for doubtful accounts or net of the amount that you think is not going to be collectible in the future, right? So you always have to have an estimate of how much of uh, AR is not going to be collectible and that's going to be your allowance for doubtful accounts. And so the presentation here is net of allowance for, that, for doubtful accounts. And so the balance at your end is $8 million. And the reliability gap principle here applies in a way that 
that you should be able to verify this information with an independent third party or the customer. So if I'm an auditor and I come into the company and I want to verify the information on the AR balance and the balance sheet, I need to be able to send a confirmation letter to the customer and have the customer verify back to me that this information is correct, right? So the reliability factor here is that um, your AR balance is supported by invoices that is acknowledged by customers. And so if I ask the customers, hey, do you owe this money? Um, yes, they'll say, yes, we do owe this money. So this is how this information is reliable here. And so the next item up is gonna be accrual. And the accrual principle here says that, you know, GAAP doesn't support cash accounting, right? So most companies, when they start out, they use cash accounting. And then as they get bigger and have investors, they start using accrual accounting, right? And I'll leave a link up here to my video on the difference between cash accounting and accrual accounting. But basically with accounts receivable, we are here saying that when we make a sale, the sale that you make is recorded against accounts receivable versus waiting for the cash to come in to record the sale, right? So under cash accounting, you wait for the cash to come in under accrual accounting and the accrual principle here, you record your sales against accounts uh, receivable. Uh, the next item up is going to be full disclosure. And so um, some of the things that you want to disclose uh, in relation to accounts receivable is going to be any concentration of accounts receivable with one customer. And so as an investor, as you can imagine, you'd want to know this kind of information, right? You'd want to know if there's a big concentration, there's one large customer that owes 20% of the entire accounts receivable balance because um, the risk is that if that customer goes out of business, uh, or for whatever reason you can't collect the cash, this is a big risk, right? So think of, think of the things that you would wanna know as an investor, and these are the things that you most likely uh, would need to disclose. And by the way, this template here in its entirety, uh, and in terms of balance sheet and also on the income statement side, so an explanation on the gap principles for the income statement. This template here can be downloaded on my website, uh, so go ahead and check it out. I'm gonna leave a link down below. The second item here that you would want to disclose is any amounts that are at risk of write-off. So if you know of some of the accounts or some of the invoices that are outstanding that have a good probability or good likelihood of being written off, uh, these are some of the things that you want to disclose as notes to your financial statements. The next principle here is conservatism, and I don't mean this kind of conservatism. What I mean here is the conservatism of showing accurately the balances in your balance sheet and accounting for anything that can go wrong. And so with accounts receivable, uh, you need to accrue or you must accrue for allowance for doubtful accounts, like we said, which is what you estimate as the AR balance that's not gonna be collectible in the future. And that's the principle of conservatism here. The next account on the balance sheet is gonna be inventories. And so with inventories, the balance here is $2 million and the reliability here is that I need to be able to verify via independent count. And so if I come to you and I say, you're showing a balance of $2 million of inventory, I need to be able to go to your warehouses and verify it, right? So the information must be verifiable via independent count if needs be, by a third party, be it an auditor, a lender, or whatever the case is. And so that's the reliability for inventory. The next principle here is historical cost. And this principle states that you record items on the balance sheet, certain items at a historical cost, for inventory, obviously we'll talk about it here in a second, it's recorded at the uh, lower of cost or net realizable value, but for um, inventory, you need to keep records of the historical cost. And this is easy, right? If you have invoices from vendors, you're keeping these vendors uh, or these invoices on file so that if you wanna go back to it, you can verify the historical cost of this inventory, right? And so the historical cost principle states that you keep record of all historical costs. The full disclosure principle here says that you uh, need to disclose any material information uh, regarding inventory and so uh, some of the things that I can think of is uh, near expiration or obsolescence uh, disclosure and so if you have some inventory that is getting close to be expired or obsolete uh, basically you need to be disclosing this kind of information because investors would want to know right uh, the second item here is disclosing changes to valuation method. And with the full disclosure principle in general, you need to be disclosing any kind of accounting change or accounting principle that you are following. So if you're changing the valuation method for your inventory, this is something that you have to disclose as footnotes to your financial statements. And then the principle of conservatism, the way that applies to inventory is that you record inventory at the lower of cost or net realizable value. And what that means is that when you buy inventory, you record the cost, whatever you bought it at from the vendor. But then as time goes by, if the value goes down dramatically, and for example, if you buy it at $100 per item, and then suddenly you can only sell it for 50. And so you need to be recording it at the lower of cost or net realizable value, right? So 
this is the principle of conservatism as it applies to inventory. All right, so now we're done with the current assets section and we're gonna jump into the non-current assets. And the first item that we got here is uh, property, plant, and equipment. And so um, the balance here is shown as net and the net here is net of accumulated depreciation and the balance here sits at $18 million. And so the reliability gap principle here says that this information, uh, I should be able to verify this information via deeds, records, or count. And so if the listing that makes up the $18 million is for example, a list of equipment on the factory floor, um, I should be able to ask for a listing. And if I want to, as a third party, I can go out and observe or count the actual equipment uh, that sits on the factory floor. And so this is the reliability of information. Uh, the next uh, principle here is historical cost is that obviously we record the fixed asset at cost and we need to keep record of these historical costs uh, through you know, vendor invoices and documentation, things like that. Uh, the full disclosure principle here is that disclose any changes to the depreciation method. So if we change the method uh, from straight line depreciation to any other method, for example, we need to disclose this. And we said this before, any change to accounting method uh, needs to be disclosed as the footnote of financial statements. Uh, the principle of conservatism, as like we said before, uh, is simply is uh, accounting for anything that can go wrong. And so if we have any impaired equipment or obsolete, obsolete equipment, uh, we need to write off this equipment from the balance. And so that's the principle of conservatism here. All right, the next item up on the non-current asset is gonna be um, equity and other investments. And equity and other investments, this is what the company invests in the extra cash. So if the company has extra cash from operation, doesn't know what to do with the cash, you go out and invest it in equities, for example. So in this case, the company has some equities or stock that they own. And so uh, the way that this should be uh, tied into gap principles is that reliability, this information must be verifiable. And the way to verify it is to get custodian statements. For example, equities, I need to be, uh, be able to reach out to the custodian. For example, if it's Morgan Stanley or whoever it is, and ask for these statements to tie back into these balances. And that's how I'm able to verify it. The accrual principle here, an example is accrue any interest or dividend issue, but not yet received. And so if any of your investments is issuing you an interest or dividend as a return on your investment, and you haven't yet received the actual cash, but it's, it's actually earned during the months, you need to be able to record that as a receivable. Uh, so that's the principle of accrual here. The next principle is gonna be full disclosure. And one of the things the company will have to disclose is its investment policy. And so usually the investment policy will say how much risk is the company willing to take with its excess cash, right? So early on when a company is smaller, they're only investing their money in money market funds and certificate of deposits and things that are guaranteed in nature. But then as the company matures, uh, it's able to go out and create an investment policy that's more risky, uh, take uh, maybe invest in venture capital, equities, and things like that. And so this is the investment policy that the company must disclose. All right, jumping over to the liabilities section, uh, looking at the current liabilities. And so the first item up is gonna be uh, short-term debt. And the way that this is, uh, information should be reliable is that I, this can be verified via lender statements. Uh, so I should be able to let, uh, send out a confirmation to the lender and confirm the balance that is being owed here. The principle of accrual, you need to be accruing any interest that is owed but not yet paid. And so if you owe interest on the loan and you haven't paid it yet at period end, you need to be accruing this interest expense on your books and records, right? So this is the principle of accrual. Full disclosure principle, disclose terms of payments, duration of the loan, etc. Anything that is relevant information for the investors to know. Uh, the next item up is going to be accounts payable and with accounts payable, the reliability, I must be able or if I want to, I can tie, tie this balance back to the vendor invoices. And so uh, this is the supporting information for accounts payable. For accrual, obviously the cash hasn't been paid. And so this is a liability that is recorded, even though the cash is going to be paid in the future, which is the whole principle of accrual, right? This is the difference between accrual and cash based accounting. Cash based accounting will say you record the expense only when the cash goes out. But with accounts payable, we are accruing uh, for the cash that hasn't been yet spent, is gonna go out in the future, but the accrual principle is recording this item as accounts payable. The full disclosure principle, um, you know, the same way we talked about accounts receivable, with accounts payable, you should also be disclosing any large vendor uh, concentration. So if you have, for example, a vendor that makes up 20% of your accounts payable, you should disclose that in the footnotes. The reason being is that investors would wanna know if there's a risk, if you have one supplier that you rely on heavily, if that supplier goes out of business, this is a risk to the business, right? And so uh, disclosing any concentration of accounts payable is something that you should be doing. The next item is accrual.
accrued liabilities and these are all the liabilities that we think are probable and we can estimate the amounts and so we would accrue it and so here the amount is 26 million dollars the reliability is that we must be able to support it by evidence and so if i ask you uh, what is this balance made out of 26 million you should be able to support it with documentation um, or emails or things that can support that these uh, liabilities are probable and that you can estimate the value uh, so you can be able to record it here uh, the accrual principle, obviously, from the name, this is accrued liability, so you're recording costs that, uh, that are probable uh, and the cost can be estimated. Uh, full disclosure, uh, you must disclose probable claims in litigation uh, that are likely to materialize in significant cash amounts for the business. Next item is deferred revenue, and this is the revenue uh, that is recorded here as a liability because basically this most likely relates to cash that you receive, uh, but you haven't yet delivered the good or the services. And so now this is, sits as a liability, even though you got the cash, but you know that you have an obligation to deliver this goods or service in the future, therefore it's a liability, right? So with deferred liability or deferred revenue, uh, the reliability here is that you need to be able to support it with the calculation um, and contracts and schedules accrual you know obviously you accrue revenue when earned not when invoiced um, or not when paid so this is the uh, accrual basis for revenue um, which basically here says that you record deferred revenue uh, when you have an obligation to deliver in the future uh, full disclosure uh, you must disclose any significant contracts uh, that contribute to the balance here so if you have a big chunk of money here sitting in deferred revenue uh, you need to be able to disclose which contracts this uh, relates to now we go to non-current liabilities and we have long-term debt and these are the longer term loans that the, the business owes uh, the balance is 49 million uh, basically i need to be able to verify this information with a lender statement if i want to right so this is how this information is reliable accrual accrue any interest owed but not yet paid Full disclosure, disclose any terms of payments, duration of the loans, ETC, schedule of loans, uh, basically anything that is relevant for the investors to know, you should be disclosing here. All right, now that we looked at assets and liabilities, we'll look at the stockholders' equity. Uh, and this here is made up of common stock of $1,000, uh, or actually a $1 million, rather, because these balances are in millions. Uh, usually, this is based on the par value of the stock. Uh, additional paid in capital, which is the extra excess uh, funds paid in addition to the common stock value or the par value of the company's stock. Um, and this should be, a, you know, if I want to, I can trace it back to investments made in the company. Uh, retained earnings, uh, this is an accumulation of net income and follows pretty much the same principles discussed in the income statement tab. Uh, which is another video that I made. I'm going to leave a link to it in the description below. But basically, uh, written earnings accumulation of the net income of the business. And that's it for this video. This is how I tie each of these gap principles into the balance sheet. And if you like the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. And I'll see you in the next video.